Hi, it's bright and early here in Skipperland, so I'm having my morning tea. And um, I just posted something on Instagram about how being nice is not beneficial always spiritually. It, you know, it's kind of bullshit to think that you have to be nice all the time. And if you know me very well, <laughs> I'm a little bit of a people pleaser, I admit. I have been at times, I even posted a few years ago about uh, my... Um, like why I didn't report my rape. And I was talking about um, how when I was 16 or 17 and a friend of mine raped me and I was consoling him after. Like I was consoling him because he was like, shit, I just, you know, he was realizing that he had just raped me. And I was like, you know, letting him know it was gonna be okay. Where I was the one that just got raped. And I have, throughout the years just always cared way too much about what people thought about me and and I want to be nice everyone wants to be nice you know it doesn't feel good to be angry or jealous or have really hateful feelings come up or have rage or anxiety or depression none of these things feel good but we have them we all have them at some point and the last few years especially I've been really dealing with a lot of rage I mean I always have my whole life because I have misophonia and misokinesia which are sometimes classified as neurological disorders <coughs> excuse me that can cause uh, a, a huge reaction in the nervous system probably the amygdala they're still figuring out exactly what it is but you go into an extreme fight-or-flight situation uh, when you're triggered by certain sounds or visual movements or uh, many, many things, many mundane things that might not trigger anyone else would cause a very extreme reaction in me. And I've had this since uh, I was about five or six is when it started for me. And, and so like I've held in all these, you know, this, these feelings of rage and resentment and anger. And I, I have, you know, other jealousy, whatever, throughout my life, of course, I've dealt with a lot. But uh, something, the last few months especially, I'm just like, no more bullshit. No more bullshit. No one is treating me like shit. No one's treating my friends like shit. I've been through enough. They've been through enough. If anyone gets in my fucking way, watch out. <laughs> and if you've been around me, <laughs> you may have seen some shit go down. <laughs> I've had a lot of parties in my basement and, um, you know, a lot, a lot of like students and friends show up and there was one guy who I met last summer nearby in town and, uh, we met, I was just swimming one day and he asked me if we could have lunch sometime. We had talked for like 10 minutes, so I had just met him. I didn't know him. And... I wasn't going to invite him to my house because I've had a lot of experiences where guys come over and they just automatically assume that that means that we're going to have sex and they, you know, they're not going to leave until we have sex. I mean, we don't always have sex, but, you know, it, it's like this extreme pressure or expectation that if we're even spending any amount of time together, if I'm giving them any amount of attention, that that's going to lead to sex, which is not the case. And... So he invited me to lunch. Well, he actually asked if he could come over to my house for lunch. I was like, why don't you invite me for lunch sometime, you know, out? And I said, you're not going to come over, but we can go somewhere. So we went to a park and he was aggressively trying to make out with me and, and like aggressively for, you know, and not taking no for an answer, which made me feel very unsafe and triggered all of my rage and you know but at the same time I'm just like not wanting to upset him and like I mean like I love attention and affection who doesn't but I didn't want to do anything I you know I just was kind of like shooing him away just uh, you know and and after like an hour I was like okay it's time to go I've got to go and he's like oh you're killing me you're killing me I thought you know like surely we're gonna have sex I'm like no we're not gonna have sex and he's, you know, he kept saying that, like, oh, you're killing me. I'm like, well, I'll plan your funeral. 
Do you want me to like announce it on campus in town? Should I put an obituary in the paper? Do you want me to put flyers up at everybody's and around town saying, you know, we're going to have a, a memorial service? Or how, how should I say that you died? Do you want to be like thrown out on the ditch? Do you want to be cremated? Do you want to be buried? Like, you know, <laughs> I'm killing you because I'm not going to fuck you. Fuck you. Um, so this went on we were driving back into town and it was like a 20 minute ride because we had gone a little bit out of town and then I didn't talk to him again for a few more weeks and I saw him I was riding my bike and he got on his bike and followed me uh, around the lake and he was like okay let's sit and talk and and so we sat and talked and I was like I'm not interested in dating I'm not interested in men I've got a lot going on I don't want to have sex with anyone I don't want to get involved and he was like oh I'm so sorry you know I just thought that if we were going to have lunch, like when I said we should have lunch, I just assumed that we were going to have sex. I'm like, why would you assume that we're going to have sex just because we were going to have lunch? Since when does lunch equate to sex? And he was like, I'm sorry if I made you uncomfortable. I'm like, yeah, you did. I was uncomfortable and I'm not going to fuck you. And we had this conversation for like an hour and then, um, we go back to my car, and, well, and then he starts kiss, kissing me. He starts kissing me after I spend an hour explaining that I'm not interested and I'm not gonna do anything with him. He starts kissing me, follows me to my car, and isn't going to leave until I let him in my car. I don't let him in my car, and I, and I leave, but I was just kind of like, you know, in that moment, sometimes things don't really hit me until the next day or the next day after that, and then I was so upset, and I was talking to my therapist the next day she's like the audacity of him to assume but also why did you even let him ride back to your car with you why were you still talking to him why were you being so nice to him she was just appalled at my behavior and i don't blame her i mean i don't i and why i don't i don't know is it the ego's desire to be loved and admired and have affection so deeply that we're willing to put up with so much bullshit to get it? I don't know if it's the ego or, you know, past abandonment or rejection or just loneliness or what it is, you know, that the deep desire for human love and connection and uh, yeah, just that. So, I don't know. I don't know. But something something turned. I, I swear, when I was in Europe and in Portugal, um, you know, just, I was like, I, no more bullshit. I'm not going to mess with anyone who isn't showing up for me with respect and care and listening to me and my boundaries. Nobody listens. <laughs> Sometimes they do. Some people do, but so many people do not listen to the boundaries. No means no. And whether you say it bluntly and strongly and clearly, or you kind of, you know, are giving like hints that you're not interested. Um, and so this, this guy, oh, the other thing I just have to say. So he, he messaged me after I had told him that no. And I said, we're not going to talk anymore. I'm not interested in having sex with you. And his response was like, I think we're going to fuck. It's time to insert. He said, it's time to insert. What, your pee pee in my vajayjay? -vaj or my foot in your ass? Like, what's getting inserted where? So, I was pissed at this guy. <laughs> and, like, part of me is just like, God, he is he, like, so just dumb or innocent or, like, what? Because he was just kind of oblivious to how much of a douchebag he was being. And I'm at, I'm, I've been having uh, like dance parties and stuff and people show up and it's always been super fun. Everyone's been really respectful and I, I love most people who come through, <laughs> but uh, not this past weekend, the weekend before he showed up, he showed up at one of my dance parties and not knowing, he didn't know that it was my house because when, when I met him over the summer, he was, I was living somewhere else. So I had moved into this house since then, but I didn't tell him because we're not friends. And I had been really like kind of angry at him and angry at myself that I did let him follow me back to my car and, you know, wasn't more just direct and rude and a bitch to him, quite frankly. Sometimes that's what you have to be. And so he shows up at my dance party and I'm hella triggered. I'm so upset. 
that he's here, but I'm also having a really good time and I don't want to have it like ruin my good time. Um, I have another friend who's here who's from Tigre in Ethiopia. And he was, when I met him, we, we really connected because, um, uh, you know, I was going through a lot of trauma and I was experiencing a lot of rage and anxiety at the time and, you know, severe like PTSD flare up. And he was just like, just be in the moment. Like, all we have is right now. You know, he's like, where I come from, like, there's so much bad shit happening all the time. Women are being raped. And and I and I went home and watched because I wasn't too aware of what was happening in Ethiopia and Tigray and, um, and just how that is like that that is being used as a weapon sexual assault against women is being used as a weapon to weaken and destroy the mindset of the people in that area and i was so upset you know i was so upset and triggered by that of course because um it's like this is not something to be taken lightly and like how could he not understand how upset i was um and of course he doesn't know that much about me or my past and my my history and uh and you know anything and and i also didn't know that much about what was going on where he's from until we had that conversation and he's been here at times when you know i've been upset that that men have been um kind of aggressive with either myself or other women in the in the party and that night that this guy who, uh, you know, invited me to lunch showed up at the party. I told, I told my friend from Tigray and a few other people, I was like, if he does anything, I'm going to go off on that motherfucker. Like I am going to, shit's going to go down. And I even told the DJ, I was like, if he does anything, that guy right there, if he does anything, I'm going to turn down, the, I'm going to turn off the music and I'm going to blast this motherfucker in front of everyone. And so, you know, I was also trying to have a good time, but I had to go upstairs. I was so upset. A friend of mine was there. Um, we were talking, you know, and he just kind of like, just, just honestly just held me and just comforted me and, you know, kind of helped my, my body settle down, my nervous system settle down because I was so angry. And then I came back down and I was enjoying the party. And there was another guy here who was being really aggressive with, with women and like just, you know, dancing, like trying to get really close with me and every other woman here. And by the end of the party, you know, a few of us women were standing around and saying, yeah, tonight was great. Everything was great, except for that one guy. And we're like, yeah, we know who that one guy is. Sometimes there's more than one guy, but you don't want to be that one guy that every woman is talking about, knowing that you're the creep, you're the asshole, you're not respecting a woman's boundaries. You're, um, you know, just keep pushing and pushing and pushing when they say no. And that makes women feel so unsafe are people not just it's not just man and woman it's just people if you're not being respected if your boundaries are not being respected it can make you feel so unsafe so that night he was he was like you know keep he kept being aggressive with various women here and one of them was here with that guy who had invited me to lunch lunch and he had told him to, you know, to back off, to not um, keep pushing and, and being aggressive with this woman and like flirting with her and trying to dance with her and be all close and like touch her and stuff. And he kept and he kept doing it. So the guy who invited me to lunch jumped up and started he was going to physically fight him. And I and I was sitting here actually right here, like against, you know, behind the bar and DJ booth. And I got up and I went and picked him up by like the collar. And I was just like. Do not fuck with me or anyone in my fucking house. Get the fuck out of here right now. And, you know, I was just, and he was just like, because he didn't actually realize that it was me because I had so much makeup on and a wig. So he didn't even recognize that it was like me and that he knew me. And I called him by his name and he was just kind of like, wait, what? You know, who are you? And then he like ran out of here. And this has happened a couple times when like guys have been really aggressive with, with me and I've just you know, just gone up and just been like, get the fuck out <laughs> and just yelled at them and blasted them. And so my, like my, my friend who's living with me, he was like, I saw you be really aggressive with somebody tonight. And I was like, yeah, because he was not respecting my boundaries. And he kept cornering me all night long and trying to talk to me. And I was, I was starting to feel unsafe and I'm not going to be nice to guys like that. I am not going to be nice to anyone who does not respect my boundaries. 
and who makes me feel threatened? I don't know. And I had a conversation um, because I ran into that guy that I picked up and, and yelled. I saw him at the grocery store the next day. He was at like Starbucks and, uh, you know, drinking tea and, and working and stuff. And, um, and I went over to him. I was like, do you know why I was so mad at you the other day or yesterday? And he was just like, I have no idea, you know? And, and I explained to him, um, you know, why I was so mad after like, we went to the park and he wasn't, he kept being aggressive with me physically, why I was mad after, um, you know, after then we talked about it and then he started kissing me and wouldn't leave me when I was at my car. And I was already mad before he showed up at the party. And he, he just had no idea. He was like, I thought we were friends. I thought we were cool. And, and I was like, that was very rapey behavior. I'm not saying that you raped me, but I'm saying that is very rapey behavior. And if a woman doesn't know whether or not you're going to stop and respect her boundaries, or if you're going to keep going and push and physically violate her, then it is a scary very scary, very uncomfortable feeling. And we had a, a long conversation about it. He had a friend there and I was like, I'm not talking with, with you anymore unless, you know, we're sitting here with your friend and his friend was really cool and just like trying to help us understand like, because, you know, he didn't understand why I was so mad at him when he showed up at my house. I was also mad at the guy that was being aggressive with all the women. And I was going to talk with him another time, but I didn't see him that week. And I got all my rage and anger out with this guy. <laughs> you motherfucker. <laughs> I was so pissed. <laughs> and if I had seen him, if I had seen him that day, I would have let him have it. But I didn't see him all week. And so I'm sitting here, you know, at, um, at my house this past Saturday and I have some, uh, some friends over and we're hanging out, listening to music. And we had a group meditation and all this stuff. And I'm having a very good time. I'm in a very good mood. We did a whole guided, uh, heart meditation, uh, in the evening and I was just feeling so good. And, and I honestly wasn't even really wanting to have a party. I just wanted to like enjoy dancing and I was enjoying being by myself. There was a lot of people had left by then and it was great. <laughs> and I didn't want to be up all night. And so, um, so, you know, I see this guy come in who, who had not been, uh, you know, taking no for an answer and just kept pushing against all these women the previous weekend. And he came over to me and, and, and he said, look, I'm sorry. I was such an asshole last weekend. And, and he just, he apologized. He said that he had lost a job that day and he was really upset. He was really, really drunk. And that, um, he, you know, he just didn't have any control over, over what he was doing that night. And yeah, he was drunk, but, but, and this is one of the things that has come up because I don't drink. I haven't had alcohol in many years. It's been like, I don't know, 26 years or something that I, um, have been sober and free from alcohol. Um, but so I'm not quite used to seeing people that out of control drunk because I don't go to bars. I, I, if I do, it's just to see music or concerts. And, you know, I, and I, but I also am an addict and I do, have dealt with a lot of um, impulse, uh, you know, and, and compulsive behaviors and, and trying to, um, you know, manage that so that I am not doing things that are like destructive for myself or other people. And I know it's not easy. It's, it's, it's like truly one of the most difficult things that I've done is, and I'm, and I'm not done, like I'm done and I'm recovered, but it's an ongoing process and it's not easy to own your shit and, you know, face up to your mistakes and, and try and correct those behaviors. It's, it's extremely difficult because you have to, in my opinion, and a lot of people's opinion, you have to address underlying trauma and pain that is there, that it's causing you to want to drink or do drugs or do other behaviors um, that will make you feel good temporarily so that you don't have to feel the pain. And I might be oversimplifying that. It's very complex. And so he apologized and I was like, it's okay. It's cool, but don't do it again. And don't show up here and treat women that way. You cannot treat women that way. You cannot treat me that way. I don't want to see 
women being treated that way. One of the, there was a woman there. He was being really aggressive with her, and and she was just like, "Don't get too excited." <laughs> he still didn't get it. Again, you know, I don't know if he was just really drunk and, or if, if he was just clueless. But, but my theory is that you can be really drunk and not be an asshole. And when people are really drunk and disrespectful and are an asshole to me, then. Um, in my space, especially, uh, you know, in, in my house. I, I created this beautiful space, mostly for me, because I live here, <laughs> but I want to share it with beautiful people. I want to have beautiful times in it. And, you know, of course, life is life and things aren't always beautiful and they're not always easy, um, but it is so important to use your voice and to stand up for yourself and to stand up for other people who cannot stand up for themselves or who maybe have not found that inner voice themselves to do so. <clears throat> but I love, I love, I love what, um, what that, uh, the last post that I shared on my Instagram about how, you know, being nice all the time and thinking that you have to be nice to be spiritual is just complete bullshit. It's a complete fallacy. This is such a great, uh, the Kali Oracle by um, Alana Fairchild. She's written a lot of different um, books and Oracle decks. And I, I drew this card the other day and it has stuck with me so intensely. It was um, Guna Tantrika. And uh, it says, and pardon me because I, I might use some Sanskrit terms like sattva, rajas, and tamas. And sattva, it's like sort of very light and, and pure and nourishing and life supporting. Rajas is more like, um, like if you're thinking about like foods, which in Ayurvedic terms, sattva, rajas, and tamas, these three gunas can be used to describe anything. But sattva might be like, like fresh vegetables, fresh live vibrant foods that are going to be really good for your body. Um, rajas would be things that might be a little bit more, uh, not totally heavy, but like things like maybe hot, some hot pepper or things that are going to be kind of activating for the body. Thomas is more doling, like very kapha. So rajas would be more pitta aggravating, po possibly um, could be. Uh, Raja, Thomas would be more kapha, like um, inertia and heaviness. Um, you know, ice cream and pizza, you know, you can think of just foods that are just gonna, you're gonna be kind of like in a food coma after maybe Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> so, but these qualities can be applied to anything. And there's so much emphasis in, in a lot of spiritual communities on, on increasing sattva, um, that purity element, which is really important, but it's a balance and all three have their, play their part. <clears throat> and I love this, uh, this description of it. It's perfect. The Divine Mother manifests the cure for when we feel overwhelmed or confused, or when we feel we're falling apart or locked into stagnation. She is the superior medicine. Even when we may not be sure what is needed to bring ourselves back into balance, she holds the answers. Tune into your heart, and there you will find her sacred prescription. Trust your inner guiding sense of what to do or not do next. Trust that a better order is being established. Guna Tantrika is Kali as the medicine mother. She generates and regulates the three inherent qualities within all phenomena, including our body, mind, and soul. These three qualities are known as the three gunas, sattva, rajas, and tamas. As sattva, Kali is the peaceful detachment and contentment in the moment. She is the fire of Rajas, the energy for taking action and hustling for our sacred manifestation. When our actions rest upon a pure-hearted foundation, our activities can become enlightened, bringing spiritual benefit to all beings, even if we don't always recognize the positive and far-reaching impact of our actions at the time. When we need to slow down to heal, ground ourselves, and regroup, Kali is Thomas, the heaviness that allows energy to settle. This is the temporary inertia that stills momentum and allows for deep restoration and renewal. 
The freedom to take rest helps us stay the course for however long is needed to manifest our destiny without becoming desperate, despairing, or exhausted. In such rest, we reset, accessing the courage to drop our attachment to external support systems and even our own plans. When we become increasingly able to allow rather than trying to direct and control the manifestation of her divine plan through us. As we call upon her, Callie strengthens these qualities within. Listen to your heart for her guidance. Do you need to be peaceful, to take action, to let go and regroup? Your inner wisdom is her voice guiding you. Excess Thomas keeps us enslaved in a negative holding pattern. Then the guna or energy that can help actually hinders. We need Kali, the tantric priestess of the gunas, to intervene for our cure. Thomas can manifest as depression and procrastination, the inability to rise and take steps forward, or as action taken without thought of how it may affect others. To overcome excessive Thomasic energy, Kali can stimulate us with divine fire, creating rajas, a powerful urge to take action. She may evoke agitation within or around us that compels us to act. She is not asking us to become reactive, but to have the confidence and courage to engage with what is happening from a place of inner wisdom. Rajas provides us with the gift of accomplishment and a healthy exertion to dis discharge anxiety and stress and promote feelings of restfulness and a lightness of spirit. This is the piece of satisfaction and rest after achievement. The third and final guna of sattva Oh, <laughs> this is the piece of satisfaction and rest after achievement, the third and final guna of sattva. Without Kali's wisdom and correction, rajas can easily shift into over, overactivity that doesn't accomplish much and leaves us feeling drained rather than satisfied. We sink back into Thomas instead of rising up to a sattvic state. Kali teaches us how to act without becoming caught up in the need to be busy for the sake of it. As we call upon her, she helps us to pour our energy into that which genuinely provides nourishment for the soul. <clears throat> and this, this is my favorite part coming up. And this was just like, this is why I had to read this. Kali knows that excess sattvic energy leads to detachment to the point of being dismissive or indifferent in the face of suffering. Sattva needs to be balanced so that it inspires rather than extinguishes our desire to act in ways that help alleviate the suffering of others. Yet it can also provide us with the comfort of detachment so we can let go and strengthen ourselves if the pain we encounter in the world feels overwhelming. Kali is the inner knowledge of when and how to disengage from the emotional energy of others without losing compassion or becoming dismissive. <sighs> Guna Tantrika manifests her wisdom and healing through our spiritual instincts. The body and mind know when there is a need for rest, for activity, for detachment, and for engagement. It takes strength of spirit not to override that inner knowing with social pressure or inhuman expectations for constant performance. When Guna Tantrika arises in a reading, we are asked to, to trust the shifting cycles and to give ourselves what we need for well-being. No being benefits when they are at odds with themselves. You have the inner power and capacity to be at peace within your own being now. I love that so much. <laughs> it was just perfect. Um, so again, I was reading from uh, the Kali Oracle guidebook by Alana Fairchild. And, you know, the, these, these qualities, 
um, definitely, I think, are associated with Kali, but you don't have to even necessarily associate them. These are universal qualities that we all need rest, and it is important to know sometimes we do have to act and we do have to fight, but also to take rest and nourish ourselves. And sometimes we can engage, sometimes we have to disengage. And, you know, and just, I'm like, I'm an empath and I take on people's energy and, and I feel so much. And sometimes I just have to shut down, like, and I've done so many things in the past so that I didn't have to feel, so that I didn't have to feel pain and suffering, my own or others. And that doesn't serve me or others. Sometimes, sometimes it does. And I have been very dismissive of myself and others in the past. And, um, you know, I'm here learning and growing as we all are and I hope you are too. Don't take shit from no motherfuckers. <laughs> Got that? Alright, I'm gonna do my morning meditation now. I love you.